You're listening to episode 93, Defining Your Illness So That It Doesn't Define You, with Mark Hoberman. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome to this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate having you here, as always. And I have a great episode for you today. I'm going to be joined by Mark Hoberman of GreatSuccess.com and author of Search and Seizure, Overcoming Illness and Adversity. Before we get into it, I do just want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past, that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an MP3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you can go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So we're going to be talking today about overcoming illness and adversity. And what's great about Mark's story and his message is that it's one that can apply to different situations. So if you've gone through some type of adversity in your life, and you know it doesn't even have to be a physical illness, even though that's... Um, what was the situation for Mark, um, if you've gone through something, then this episode, you know, and what Mark has to share is going to resonate with you. And certainly if you have gone through a physical illness that has been debilitating and has, you know, affected your life, um, then this is absolutely going to resonate with you as well. And in Mark's case, it was getting diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of 16 three months after moving from his childhood home to a new state with his family, that is what, you know, really impacted his life and what he has had to uh, work to overcome as he became an adult. So he's going to share that story and that experience with us today. And we're going to talk about what causes epilepsy and the role that stress can play in it. And he's going to share about how he didn't have a support system at the time because there was this stigma associated with it, much like you'll find with mental illness. And he's going to talk about how we can define our struggles rather than having them define us. And that's really his big take-home message here. And he's going to share with us what his mother said to him that changed his mentality around his illness. And we're going to talk about living with and growing from your struggles. And the reaction that he got when he released his book, because only... Less than 10 people knew about his situation at the time, and he's going to share why he sees his illness as a strength and not a weakness, and we're going to talk about growing and learning from adversity, and how you have to become the first person in your support system, and how everyone else who becomes a part of your support system is going to be just like spokes in the wheel, and you're going to be at the center of that. So some really good stuff here, and I'm excited to share it with you. And so without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it, and I'm going to bring Mark on. Mark, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Thanks for having me, Melissa. I do appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. And so I found out about you, just like I did my previous guest, through RadioGuestList.com, and you were featured as a test prep expert and teen illness survivor And so I wanted to know more about the teen illness survivor part. And it turns out that you recently published a book about your story called Search and Seizure, Overcoming Illness and Adversity, where you talk about how you were diagnosed with epilepsy in your late teens and how that impacted your life. And in getting ready for this call today, I also know that you were determined to not let your illness define you. And so I definitely want to talk more about that today because I think that When you get an illness like that, or if you were abused growing up, or if you experienced bullying, then it's not uncommon to feel like those things define you. And 
it can be difficult to get to a point where you feel like it's a part of your story, but it's not everything that you are. So Mark, what I like to do here is start at the beginning of your story and then work our way up to where you're at today. Does that sound okay to you? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to, you know, kind of have you start us out by, you know, telling us what was your life like um, up until the point where you get diagnosed, where things pretty good, things pretty normal. Yeah. So I had uh, what I still think today was an amazing childhood uh, because I was brought up in Yonkers, New York in a five building complex called Sador Lane. Uh, I was within walking distance of my elementary school. I was one minute walking distance away from my high school, uh, 16 years in the same building from birth till we moved to Florida. It was great. Had a lot of friends, started the dating circuit, you know, as you do when you get into high school, really having a good time and loving the people I was with. I was part of a, uh, the high school band, which was the junior high school and high school band, which was very successful. Played The marching band played for uh, President Ford 35, 40 years ago. So really enjoying it. And, uh, then, uh, you know, when I was in ninth grade, my parents came in in September and said, listen, you know, we want to, uh, dad wants to semi-retire and, and move part of his business. He had a used furniture business, we wanted to move it to Florida. So we're going to leave. And uh, they gave me three weeks notice. So that was, uh, that's a terrible age to move. That's a st- terrible three weeks is not a good amount of time to get ready to move. So that's when everything got very stressful. Yeah, you have like a lot of things to take care of and say goodbye to your friends absolutely, and everything, right? Absolutely. They're really, really in my comfort zone. So now I am a person comfortable where I am, loving my childhood. And three weeks later, we moved to Florida. Now, it was bittersweet because uh, my grandmother was there. I had aunts and cousins that I was very close with uh, there. But my friends weren't there. It was a totally different school. So, uh, you know, we get there and I end up, uh, I had a lot of money saved from doing a paper route in Yonkers and a penny saver out, babysitting, I always worked. And uh, I bought a car, beautiful 1977 Mustang. That car car is on the cover of the uh, of the book. And that, the, the name Search and Seizure is a play on words because uh, it has nothing to do with the Fourth Amendment search and seizure. In my life, it was the search for myself through a seizure disorder because three months into owning that car, I drove with my cousin Candace to visit her brother, my other cousin Mark, at the University of Florida in Gainesville and at five in the morning, lack of sleep, woke up early to leave early to be able to spend the entire day there. And I was very incoherent on the ride, at the very beginning of the ride, passed the exit several times. And the rest of what I'm gonna tell you, I'm telling you secondhand because I have no memory of it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suffered a petite mal seizure behind the wheel of the car originally, that was the incoherency part. And about four minutes after that, on the way, about, I want to say 200 feet away from a, tele, uh, um, a toll booth, uh, I suffered a grand mal seizure. I stiffened up, lost the wheel of the car, control of the car, let go of the wheel. Um, this is all, you know, again, secondhand. My cousin had to grab the wheel. Luckily, I had enough uh, foresight to know that there was a uh, toll booth in front of us, so I, I had slowed down. But it was still going at a decent pace, and, you know, we, it doesn't matter how fast you're going when you don't have to control the car, it's not good. Yeah, that must have been a really scary situation. Yeah, she had to throw the car into reverse at the park, you know, hurt the transmission a little bit, but somehow got us through the toll booth uh, without a problem. And before we smacked into any embankment, she was able to swing her leg over and hit the, uh, hit the brake pedal. So we did stop. Cops came, thought I was on drugs. I said, I'm fine, got up, fell down. Uh, next thing I know, three hours later, I, I leave the hospital with a bottle of Dilantin, which is anti-seizure medication, and a diagnosis of epilepsy at the age of 16 and a half, three months after leaving my home, and now things really get stressful. Mm. Now, you know, I, I'm not like terribly familiar with epilepsy, and you know, maybe for a lot of people listening, they're not either. And I think it's probably one of those things that you don't know a lot about unless it affects you. Um, so, tell us, like, you know, what causes it, and like. Do you know what caused it for you? It sounds like maybe does stress play a role? Uh, well, actually, so, so stress can't cause epilepsy, but it can cause a seizure in those who have epilepsy. So epilepsy can happen in many ways. Some people, they don't know. Some could be from a hit on the head, from an injury. Still others uh, from uh, heredity. And I did most likely uh, get it that way because my grandfather's brother, my Uncle Ruby, uh, was an epileptic. 
And okay. uh, when I was 13 in Yonkers, and this is in the book, I was incoherent and I came home, couldn't explain to my mother why I came home early. She sent me downstairs to get milk from the uh, milk machine uh, so I could have something to drink with my lunch. I never came back up. So uh, she went down and I had fallen down. Now, to this day, we don't know what it is. I know what it was. It was a seizure, but nobody saw it. They don't know if I fainted because I hit, you know, because I had the fever. They don't know if I fainted because I was sick or if I got hit in the head. Or tri- They have no idea. I'm pretty sure it was a seizure, but I passed all the tests, all the medical tests, no problem whatsoever. I mean, uh, uh, tests, MRIs and, uh, and uh, brainwave with contrast, which is iodine in the veins. Nothing showed anything except the, this EEG, which doesn't hurt at all. It's the least invasive of all the tests I took. Just some wires in my head, electrodes. That showed some irregularity. But they said, listen, uh, we don't know exactly what this irregularity is. He did have a head injury uh, you know, today. So uh, why don't we wait and come back in six months? Nothing happened since that, uh, at that you know, six-month period. So we just never went back. And then I didn't have this other seizure, if it was my second seizure, uh, until three or four years later. So pretty much, pretty sure it was heredity in my, in my case. Now, lack of sleep can bring it on in epileptics. I did have lack of sleep the night that uh, before we went to visit my cousin. Stress, of course, I had stress from moving. Uh, so things like that can, uh, you know, not taking your medication, of course, and not being protected. Also, if you're an epileptic, um, taking other medications, you have to be very careful that the, uh, the doctor really knows the pharmacology and that you're in touch with the pharmacist because sometimes they miss it. And some things, you know, lower the efficacy of the medication. So that can cause it too. But in mine, we're pretty sure it was heredity. Okay, gotcha. So this must have been like pretty distressing for you, right? Like, how did this end up kind of affecting your day-to-day life at this point? Well, at that age, it it affected it beyond enormously. I couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. I was a teenager in a a really hot car back then. Uh, couldn't drive it for six months. States vary on, on, the, on the laws, but I was in Florida, and at the time, I, you couldn't drive for about six months unless you were seizure-free. Uh, I was seizure-free, I think, for a certain six-month period, but I don't think it was six months right away. I, I had seizures on the medication. I don't think I, I received good medical care in uh, Florida. Uh, only had a few friends. You know, we had just gotten there in, in Florida at the time, so that was very tough because you don't have the support system that you really need. And, uh, you know, there weren't Facebook groups like you have today. My parents really didn't have anybody to turn to. No one else in my family had this kind of illness. So that, you know, you, you can't drive. You, you can't swim without, um, you can't swim alone. You know, to be in a beach community and not be able to run to the beach and just jump in the water, you know, while your friends are laying down sunning themselves is, is not good either. But also, because of the stigma attached, I didn't tell anybody. So mm-hmm. very few people, if anyone, even my, some of my relatives in Florida did not know. Uh, close relatives did, but other ones, you know, who didn't live nearby, we just didn't tell them, which I could tell you as an educator of 33 years, that was a mistake. Uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't even tell my teachers. Eventually my parents did because I refused to. But <clears throat> there were things I didn't even tell my parents. I, I wrote in the book about, you know, why I ended up watching The Tonight Show. Back then, you know, it was starring Johnny Carson. I would never stay up that late, but my medication that I lent and that I took at night, about two or three hours after I took it, it was so toxic, it was, it was the wrong dose, that it made me so dizzy. I couldn't get back into bed without crawling, and I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't allow my parents to see that I had this issue. I didn't know it was the medication. I thought it was the epilepsy, and I thought that they were struggling so much and so emotional about it. I said, look, if it's only me crawling into bed, I'll do it, but they went to bed at like 11.30, 12 o'clock, so I had to go to bed after them. So I was... That's how I'm, other people see a show and it, it means different things to them. When I watch that show, which I still watch to this day, uh, I, I have different memories. The reason I started to watch that show was because of my epilepsy, because of my toxic medication and having to stay up so I could crawl into bed once my parents went to sleep. So it touched so many different parts. I mean, I had a girlfriend then, but you know, uh, we had a, a problem. Her parents refused to let her drive with me, which as a parent, I absolutely understand, certainly now that I have two sons of my own. But, you know, they never discussed it with me. They never said, tell us about the epilepsy. Are you controlled? Are you not controlled? So, you know, you get kind of embarrassed, insulted, and, uh, you know, there's nothing good about it. So you have physically, I'm not feeling well. Uh, Mentally, I'm not feeling well. I'm away from what I consider to be my home. And, you know, I'm I'm taking a medication that quite honestly is not working 100%. I, I had several seizures while still on this medication. And you can bite your tongue. So between the physical and the, uh, the medication itself had side effects. So it really pretty, pretty much was a teenage perfect storm. Mm. 
Yeah, sounds like just a very challenging situation to be in. Um, and so because you weren't able to talk about it with a lot of people and there was kind of that stigma attached to it, like, did it make you feel like you were different at that point? Yeah, I mean, it did make me feel like I was different. I always had a good sense of humor, so I tried to use that as a defense mechanism. There's no way you're not different. I mean, first of all, that's the, the point of the book. Uh, it's not just for epileptic. It's for parents and teens. It's for people to see that, you know, don't let, you know, my whole mantra, as you said, is don't let your, your issues, your illnesses, your struggles define you. You define them. I am not who I am in spite of my illness. I, I am who I am because of my illness. And I had to make the decision to embrace it and to research it and to get to know it better because, yeah, I'm different. But everyone is different in some way, everyone on the planet. And that's something easier for me to say now after 32 years in education and having lived with this since the age of 16. Uh, but I'm hoping people get it sooner. If there was a book like this out there when I was first diagnosed, it would have been a lot easier for my, my parents. I think I would have fared better. And uh, you know, to know you're not alone and to know that it's okay to be different, that's very hard to impart to teenagers today. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to do for them and their parents. Mm -hmm. Now, when did you start to have this mentality of, you know, you're not going to let this define you? Uh, so when I was first diagnosed, I was given a foundation for this way of thinking, although I didn't take it in fast enough. My mother, and, and uh, there was a, a professional reviewer who gave the book five stars and said that uh, he felt that what he read uh, in the book, that the advice my mother gave me, she was in the room with my father for a while. I'm sure there's a lot of crying, emotionality. She was, I mean, she cried at the drop of a hat. If somebody wants something on a game show on TV, she would cry. So I know that was a really tough hour or so in her room. When she came out, I, I saw her eyes were red, but she sat me down. She said, look, you're a good looking boy. You're funny. You're intelligent. You have a good, a lot of friends. And you know what else? You have epilepsy. And this is going to keep you grounded and you're going to learn from this. And we're going to, we're going to deal with this as a family and we're going to get you the help that you need. But you're going to live with this and through this and you're going to become stronger because of it. And uh, I basically just, you know, started to take that in at that time. But it took quite a while because it's, it's hard to take in while you're still having seizures. And, and I can say that today because I was lucky. I mean, once I went to New York and found a doctor, an amazing doctor, Columbia Presbyterian, uh, he gave me a pill and I never had a seizure again on, on that medication ever. And uh, that's incredible. And I'm only learning now after being in so many epilepsy Facebook groups and people who are reading the book are, uh, are emailing me. And it's, it's not just people who have epilepsy, but I, I have spoken to many whose kids have epilepsy. And I'm amazed at how many people um, are not controlled. I just did a book signing about two weeks ago in Piermont, New York, in, in a store called Presence uh, of Piermont. And many people came and, you know, had, had no you know, illnesses that I know of, but just came by, came in the store, talked to me, wanted to have the book. But some came because we put it on Facebook and they said, you know, my husband's an epileptic and we read the reviews and we really want to read X, Y, and Z. But they start telling me how many people just are not controlled. So I, I'm blessed because, uh, because I, I am controlled. And, uh, you know, so I guess as I got older, I really started to take a, a, a turn for not letting it control me when I started to research it more. Now, keep in mind, in, in 1977, researching this was quite different. I had to go into a library, I'm probably dating myself now, but I had to look it up on microfiche, which I'm sure some of your listeners don't even know what I'm talking about, because mm -hmm. uh, that's like saying VHS to some people today. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, what took me a month of uh, contacting the Mayo Clinic in different hospitals across the country and uh, speaking with some doctors and going to the library could, could probably be done in 45 minutes on the internet today. So, you know, I had to arm myself with more information. No, I wasn't alone. No, I had to deal with certain things. And it wasn't easy. Look, the teenage years are hard enough as it is. Take that with, you know, a diagnosis of epilepsy at 16 and a half. Add to that being in a new place without my friends and that kind of support system that I had having it within, within three months, not being allowed to drive, just all of these things weighed down. But, you know, I started to chip away at it and realize, hey, I'm going to have this. This isn't going away. This is not a cold. So, uh, you know, it's time to sink or swim. And I had to make a conscious decision to live with it and grow from it. Mm, I love that. And how you, you know, just started to take back control from it. Because I'm sure with 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 a condition like that, I mean, you must feel at times that it has control over you, right?
no, no, no doubt. And it's so interesting you say that because when it has control over me, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not aware of it. You know, so in the book, I, I say something that people say is very poignant. It says, you know, you you, you, cl you clinch down on your teeth, you can bite your tongue, uh, you have no memory of the seizure, the blessing and the curse. Yes, it's a blessing. You have no memory of it. You don't know people looking at you, laughing at you. You don't feel the pain at the time. You might feel the pain of the residual effects afterwards. But, um, you know, not only do I not have any control over it, but I'm not aware of it when it, the it, the seizure, occurs. You know, sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. You, you don't want to not have a memory of something that happened to you. That's, mm -hmm. that's not a pleasant thing either. But, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I love how, you know, you started to just do the research and empower yourself and, and learn as much as you could about it so that you could start to understand it, you know, and, and do things to help yourself and, and take that control back. And, you know, as you say, to, to not let it define you, you know, um, cause I, I think, you know, we're very fortunate today that we have the internet, you know, and we can do that research and there's so much information available to us on any topic. You know? Oh, without a doubt, you can talk to people on Facebook, you can go on Twitter, you can look things up on WebMD, you can find people and then they contact you, you can ask them. There are people asking questions that I would love to ask. I didn't know what the dizziness was for at least a month. You know, if someone would have said, hey, I'm on daily and 2, it makes me dizzy, it might be too toxic, then 30 days sooner I would have known what, what the deal was. So uh, it, it was very difficult then. But, you know, people still have these problems today, even with the internet. Some children, teens in particular, don't want to admit to them their food their friends or their parents, certain problems they're having. This manifests itself from bullying. I mean, I do a lot of anti-bullying training in my camp consulting business in the summer where I do staff orientations. And, uh, you know, I did this for years. And now with, with the Internet, now you can have cyber bullying and with the texting and the picture of this. And you do something embarrassing and, and 400 people can see it in less than 20 seconds on Snapchat and Instagram. So it's it's a different world. So well, you know. the internet can be a blessing and a curse as well. Correct, absolutely. <laughs> so then you said that, you know, not many people knew <clears throat> about your situation, um, and so you wrote your book, right? And so, what happened? You know, what what was that like at that point when people started to find out about it, and particularly like people who had, you know, known you, your, uh, you know, throughout your life. What was what was the reaction to that? Uh, I should have written it sooner because the reaction was outstanding and I uh, should have more faith in certain people and you have to learn that if certain people, you know, stray away from you because of it or for whatever reason, they're not the people you want to be friendly with anyway. So it's really, it has to be quality over quantity. I actually started writing the book several years ago and got busy and just put it aside and uh, when my son was about 15 or 16, uh, he was diagnosed with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, lost a lot of weight, was such a happy-go-lucky kid, but then some skin issues, non-related, happened at the same time. And I started to see him become victim to what I call the perfect storm. And, uh, you know, I said, we're going to take the same thing my mother told me, we're going to leave no stone unturned. I mean, my kids knew I had epilepsy. They, that's all they knew. I had epilepsy. It was said in passing once. I never had a seizure in front of them, never had a seizure since they were born. Uh, so they really didn't know anything about it to that extent. And my wife finally said to me, you know, you're handling this very well, but so calmly, how is that possible? And the light bulb went off and I said, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm handling it this way, good, bad, or indifferent, because I live this. And the light bulb went off. Uh, you know, I am an educator at heart. I said, you know, if I can help you through this and our family and certainly our son and myself as we do this too, I, I, I know I can help other people out there. I know people who I tutor in my tutoring business. Of course, I've taught for 32 years. I've had thousands of students. And I know, I know for a fact, uh, especially when we had more access to medical cards when I started teaching in the Bronx 33 years ago, you know, I, I know there are students I've had who have been epileptics, asthmatics, diabetics, uh, people who've had trauma in their lives, abuse, all, all these things. Because when you're in education, as long as I have been, it runs the whole gamut. And uh, that's what made me uh, write the book. And once the book went out there, um, I, I put it on Facebook and my friends first. And I said, boy, am I really hitting this send button? So I hit the send button and I started to get responses back, phone calls. I mean, I keep in mind, fewer than 10 people on earth knew about the epilepsy. Uh, and I was 54 when they found out. And I was 16 and a half when I was diagnosed. So I had close relatives of mine uh, who had no idea that I was an epileptic. Uh, so 
I didn't know what to expect. And the greatest surprise I ever had was that I never told anybody at, at, at work. I didn't have to. I was told by my doctor I was controlled and it was up to me. But uh, not only did, did I know the teachers were going to find out and they bought the book and, and they had wonderful things to say about it, but I decided I bought as a gift to 45 of my students in my two enrichment classes last year, I bought them the book, autographed it, gave it to them, and I wrote a common core curriculum with 41 uh, questions uh, on all different levels, of all different learning standards and modalities, and I taught the book, and I didn't know what to expect. And this was a ninth grade class, and they, they just reacted so respectfully, so well, loved it so much. And it was interesting for them what I had not thought of and never occurred to me. Uh, happened the first day when I was reading the prologue and then the first chapter, and I couldn't get through the first chapter. This hand went up, that hand went up, and I said, I'm so glad you guys are so into it, but let me finish the chapter. And they said, we're sorry we keep interrupting you, but we've never had the author in front of us before. And that's the link that I forgot was going to occur, that they could get instant gratification. You don't have to say, you know, what do you think Shakespeare meant by this? Who's going to know? He's been dead for between 400, 500 years or whatever. But they could say to me, what did you mean by this? And I, I have the answer because I wrote it. You know, so it's not a mm -hmm. work of fiction. So uh, the connection was great. and Kids started to open up about it. Their own says, oh, did you know why I had diabetes? I mean, like, like it was nothing. So, you know, it, you know, it lends itself to um, respect for one another. Uh, the importance in my life of having a support staff, the fact that luckily I've had a career where I'm respected in the classroom. So they know that, hey, look where this guy has come. He's got a master's degree, uh, a tutoring business. He teaches and look at this illness that he has. And, you know, I, I don't have to let my illness define me. I'm going to define, define myself through any struggles that I have. Yeah, that's great. And I'm glad that, you know, you had such a supportive response to it. Um, it must have felt really nice to have it out in the open after all those years. It really wasn't. You know, it wasn't so much that I was afraid somebody was going to know because uh, that wasn't it. It was that I could not predict what the response would be to people knowing. And once it was out there and I got such a, and I received such a, a warm, positive response emotionally, academically, and from all walks of life, all ages, you're right. It is, it is a wonderful feeling. And I said to myself, boy, why did I wait till 54 to do this? I should have done this 25, 30 years ago, but I wasn't ready. And maybe it wouldn't have been written the same way had I written it earlier. So better late than never. And, you know, the, the message is out there and uh, that's what's most important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And it sounds like the book is, you know, helpful to like many different situations, right? I, I believe I believe that's what you're getting at. Oh, absolutely. It could, it could have a different name. It could be that I have asthma. It could be that I was bullied. It could be that I just had a stressful home life. Um, so it's, it's not a book about epilepsy. It's a book about overcoming adversity through the eyes of someone who did that, who was diagnosed with epilepsy. Now... Did having epilepsy, you know, impact your ability to work at all, or was it pretty much under control with the medication? Uh, it was under control. I, even when I wasn't under control, uh, when I was medicated, but I wasn't fully under control, I, I never stopped working. Uh, I was lucky I've, I never had a, uh, a seizure at work, except that, remember, I was diagnosed as a teen, and uh, so when I was about, I want to say 20 five to 27, the doctor said, listen, uh, you've been on this medication without any episodes for years. Some teens grow out of epilepsy. Uh, would you like to experiment going off the medication? Now's the time to do it. You're married, but you have no children. Uh, if you want to do it, this is, this is the window. This is the golden opportunity. So I said, okay. And, uh, I was off the medication. He said, if you're off the medication, you don't have a, a seizure for about 18, I think he said 18 months, it means we're headed in the right direction. You might not need medication ever again. Doing really well, uh, 16 months later, I was in school teaching. It was between periods. I was visiting a friend uh, who was in the guidance office at the time. And uh, when I went there, he wasn't there. So I was walking back to class and I'd say halfway through the walk, didn't know where I was, didn't know what was going on. And I was having a petite mal seizure. Um, nothing I could do about it. I, I had no control over it. You know, you could say, say to me, how are you? And I could say, yep, what time is it? I, I wouldn't respond normally to any question. So the elevator opened to go to the uh, third floor where I was teaching at the time. And two teachers came out and said hello. And I just nodded. 
didn't say anything. The door closed because I forgot I was going into the elevator. Am I coming out? Didn't know. Next thing I know, and again, told to me, I have no recollection. I probably walked uh, down the hallway to take the stairs to my class, and I must have had the grand mal seizure there. Uh, fell down, chipped my tooth, bleeding. And this was in the Bronx uh, in, in a middle school. They did not know what happened. Nobody knew that I had epilepsy. They didn't know if I was shot or stabbed or someone hit me. Uh, they'd locked down the school. Classes had to stay in their room. They couldn't change uh, and go through the halls uh, during the change of periods. And I was brought to a hospital. And, uh, you know, they tested me. And I had three seizures in the, uh, this was told to me. Uh, a friend was in the ambulance with me. Three seizures in the, in the ambulance. I must have had six seizures in the hospital bed at the emergency room. No memory of it whatsoever. But, you know, that was a... One of my worst seizures, the doctor said he got the test back. My amino acids were off, and I couldn't exercise for five weeks. And, uh, again, I couldn't drive for a few months. My wife had to drive me to the carpool, and here it is, as we say, deja vu all over again. Mm. Uh, I just told people in school I had a bad reaction to medication, which you can't have a seizure from reactions to medication. You just can't have an epileptic seizure necessarily. You know, you have to be an epileptic. But people have seizures who aren't epileptics every day um, across the country. So... You know, that was very difficult, and, and, I, and I did not have uh, a seizure when we went back on the medication. So I've never had a seizure on the medication, so um, it never affected my work. Uh, I work long hours. I, I, I do a lot of things besides teach. You know, I wrote the book. I go on, you know, podcasts and radio shows. On, on, I do speaking engagements and PTA functions and, and, and the different things that I do, uh, and I keep busy. And maybe I could be too busy, but I don't know. Uh, I, I like to keep busy. I think that's healthy uh, within reason. But it's never gotten in the way, thank God, of my work. However, as I say in the book, my mother was right when she said it'll keep me grounded. I've spoken in front of three and 400 people at camp conferences, re the reading, uh, the New York State and New, New Jersey reading conferences. And I know, even though it's very, very remote, I know there is a slight possibility that while I'm talking, I could go into the throes of a petite mal seizure. It's always a petite mal before a grand mal, but I know that's a possibility. And there are times, you know, when, when you have a fever and you're feeling a little off, you're like, oh, I'm sick, I'm a little off. When I have a fever or I feel a little off or if I don't get a lot of sleep and I'm feeling dizzy even for 10 seconds, my whole body and brain stops and has to refocus and say, are we in control here? Is this just a, you know, a manifestation of how you're sick this week or is this about to become something worse? So that affects me sometimes at work and everywhere I am in life, very rarely, but uh, it's, it's always there. As my mother said, this is a part of me. It's, it's, it's who I am. It's, it's part of who I am, and I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you also talk about how you see how your illness has become a strength for you and not a weakness, right? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, you know... Uh, I deal with kids all the time and, and doing this for, for over three decades, both in tutoring and, and the school system. I see people with a host of problems. You know, you can't be in education as long as I have and not had students who've been abused, who've had, uh, who've been addicted to drugs, who've had family members who are addicted to drugs, who have epilepsy, diabetes, bullied the whole nine yards. And I think that I can approach it. And I've seen some wonderful educators approach this just because of their experience, but between my experience of education and going through this um, and worried about being bullied if people knew I had epilepsy and being a new person in a new school, in a new state, which happens, you know, in my school quite often when they come in from other countries. Uh, we have a lot of people, you know, when, when they had the earthquake in Haiti, our school district where I teach in Rockland County had the biggest influx of uh, Haitian immigrants in the country just in our concentrated area. So, so to be displaced, I sort of know that. Uh, so I, it en enables me to see their world through their lens and their reality. And kids are very, very unique in that they can cut right to the chase and they know this guy either really cares or is just giving me the scripted teacher has to say this performance. And they know that I, when I speak, it comes from the heart and uh, from a real willingness to help them and assist them and uh, meet them at their reality. Mm. That's great. I love how you use it that way for good and to help others. Um, so it sounds like you're doing pretty well today and um, things are under control for you. I mean, it seems like you have to 
you know, you always kind of worry. It's always kind of in the back of your mind of whether or not, you know, you're going to have a seizure. But overall, it sounds like you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I am. Thank God. Yes, has been has been good. Found the right doctor and the right medication. So side effects here and there, but nothing terrible. So uh, I'm definitely I consider myself one of the lucky ones for sure. Mm, that's good. Do you think that you'll ever be able to get off the medication, or is it something you'll have to stay on for the rest of your I, life? I would say, unless something you know tremendous comes into play, uh, I have no desire to get off the medication because. It's not worth the risk. You know, I could be behind the wheel and hurt myself, hurt somebody else. I could be carrying my dog outside. I mean, uh, because the, the side effects are not that bad, and, I, and I'm so lucky in that it hasn't really impacted my life, the medication hasn't impacted my life, that uh, I'm probably going to be on the medication forever. Uh, I just recently switched medications. Mine was kind of antiquated. <coughs> Excuse me. And this, the new medication I'm on has fewer side effects. So, uh, you know, they're always coming in with newer things. I know there's some operations for certain uh, types of epilepsy. I'm really not a candidate for that. So uh, I would have to say that there's no plans in my future to even look into that. You know, if something comes around, of course, I would research it and talk to people. But uh, I'm happy with status quo. I'm moving forward uh, regardless. And, uh, you know, that's my philosophy on the, on the medic medication end of it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's good that, you know, you're stable and the medication's not, you know, causing you a lot of side effects. So sounds like you're in a, you're in a good place with that, uh, which is important. Yeah. Um, so I know we've been talking a little bit here and there about what it is you do today, but tell us a little more about, you know, exactly what you have going on. So, you know, after about seven, eight years of, uh, in teaching, I started to tutor and, uh, as the years progressed, it snowballed, and now I have my own tutoring business for over 20 years, great success tutoring, and uh, we do uh, all grades. I, I have teachers who work for me for kinder, you know, pre-K, K-3, to reading programs, chemistry teachers. I personally do English, and uh, we do uh, also, we've expanded to college uh, counseling and someone who does the college search and the application, the essay, and we really specialize in SAT and ACT prep, and, I, and I'm now doing a lot of... Uh, uh, educational consulting with parents, how to help their kids study better, how they can be more supportive of their children in school, how they work with the schools. And uh, I'm excited that in the last two years, we've, we've gone kind of more technological because uh, now I have an online platform where you, you know, if you picture Skype, this is almost like Skype on steroids in that I can see the person they can see me, but I can load a document up. And if they write on it with their mouse, I see what they circle, what they write. They can type. I see it in real time. And as I tell the parents, if, if you came into your child's room blindfolded while I was tutoring them, you would not know I wasn't in the room. So it's exactly the same as being with the person. And uh, it enables me to spread my knowledge and, the, and my abilities and help students you know, regardless of their location. And that's very exciting for us. That's great. And tell us where people can uh, find your book if they're interested in checking that out. So they can go to Amazon.com and, and type in search and seizure, Mark Hoberman, uh, they, M A R C, last name Hoberman, H O B E R M A N. Uh, and a lot of and they can, it's available on Kindle. Uh, I can send it to them in many ebook forms if they have iBooks or, uh, or other, other tablets and devices. Uh, so if they go to gradesuccess.com, that's the company website, G-R-A-D-E-S-U-C-C-E-S-S, -E -E greatsuccess.com. They can uh, learn more about the tutoring there, but there's also a link at the top in red that says link to Mark's author site. And that sends them right to my author site where they can see that book. I wrote a book for secondary teachers on classroom management and lesson planning. Uh, that I'm coming out with a second edition soon with that. So they can see some of that, the blogs that I've written. But the, the main hub would be gradesuccess.com. Great. And yeah, I'll have that linked up on the show notes page for everybody. So Mark, I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? That's a great question. Uh, it's like the movie Back to the Future. What would I do? Well, <laughs> I, I think it's difficult because it would be me going back and telling me, listen me, you got to embrace this sooner. You have to tell people 
And those that will help you will help you. And those that will not and stray away, let them stray away. Uh, so I would just tell myself to do exactly what I did do, but do it a lot faster and a lot sooner. And just to know you're not alone and to have faith in other people that they're going to respond in, a, in an appropriate manner, in a helpful manner. And those who don't, you know, it's hard to, for a teenager to understand this. And even as adults some now, sometimes now, if people aren't supportive, you know, it does bother me. And as a teenager, it's five times worse. But just to really give people a chance and, and, and confide in the people and that a support system is very important. I had a support system of my family, my parents, uh, but, you know, uh, and my sister who did not move to Florida with us. But enough of my, not enough of my other extended family knew uh, and they could have been very helpful. Not all my friends knew. And I think the true friends could have been helpful. So just to own what it is you have and make a decision. I have this. It's not a great thing. You know, it's nothing, you can't walk around, it doesn't mean you have to go around being proud of it, but you certainly should not be ashamed of it. We all have our human frailties. Nobody's perfect. And you can grow from adversity and learn from it. Again, I became who I am because of this illness and, and it shaped who I am and my philosophy on life and, and my work ethic and, uh, and actually the profession that I, that I chose. So I would tell myself to just have more faith in others and, uh, and be more forthcoming and, and hopeful that people will join your support network. But you have to be your own support network first. I don't want you to think that I immediately embraced this illness and grew from it. I had six months to a year of some very tough times. And uh, it was when I started to research it and could find some other people that I really took more control over my illness and my life than I had the first year when I was diagnosed. Yeah, I love how you've been able to do that. And yeah, of course, it takes a little while to get to that point, you know, and it's, you're going to go through some struggles until you do, but, uh, but yeah, you can definitely get there. Um, and the support system is such a huge part of that. And, you know, that's something that's important for any of us, no matter what we're going through, you know, and, uh, I mean, I've certainly learned firsthand that, you know, you, you can't have, uh, support if people don't know about what you're going through. <laughs> Oh, you know? Absolutely, that's that's true across the board with with, with uh, be it medical or bullying or any type of stressful situation. Uh, but I want people to realize that you have to be the person, the individual has to be the first person in the hub of that support network, and then the tentacles reach out for other support because uh, it's it's you know you're not alone in this, but. From the onset, when you first get a diagnosis as a problem, you're alone for a split second or a little longer, and then you have to decide, now I'm going to get some support from others. You don't need 500 friends and 150 family members. You, you need to become well-versed in your struggle and what your problem is, and there's so many ways of finding that out, and, and, and so, many, uh, so many places you can go on the internet and, and any kind of uh, technological devices that help you research information. So... Support is important, but it starts with the individual, and that's what you have to realize and give yourself the opportunity to say, hey, I'm not perfect. What am I going to do now to grow from this imperfection and to become a stronger person? I love that. Yeah. So before I let you go, uh, what's the best way for people to connect with you or get in touch with you? So uh, they can always email me at info, I-N-F-O, at gradesuccess.com. Uh, and they can see me on the social, all this, my social media, uh, on gradesuccess.com. And, uh, they can reach me that way and I'm happy to answer any questions and, uh, and speak to parents, their kids with their kids and answer any questions, uh, that they might have. I'm happy to be helpful. And I think paying it forward is, uh, is quite an important thing. All right. Well, Mark, thank you for coming on here today. I really appreciate it. And, you know, for sharing your story and for, you know, showing us how you haven't let your illness define you, but how you've been able to define it and take back that control over your life. Um, I think that's really inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. My pleasure, Melissa. I just want to say that I, I love the, the name grass gets greener. When I first got an email from you, I just read it quickly and I thought it said the grass is greener, uh, which is another famous saying, but I think it's such an important message that you name it the grass gets greener because as bad as something could be, you can, make it get better and you can have control over it. So uh, kudos for that name. And I, I can't thank you enough for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak on your program. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And you're very welcome. Well, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the show today. 
has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 93. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Mark Hoberman, and that's Mark with a C, to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So what I really love about Mark's story is not only was he able to get to a place where he didn't let his illness define him anymore, but rather he defined it for himself. But in doing so, he took back control of his life. And I think that that is so inspiring because I think that we're all capable of doing that. You know, whatever we've gone through, we have the ability to find a way to get control over whatever it is that we're experiencing and not allow it to control us and the way that we live our lives. And I'm actually going to be talking more about this in next week's episode. And if you listened to last week's episode, then you might recall that I mentioned that I'm going to be doing a solo episode next week where I'm going to be talking about something that I've been going through lately. And it's something that I want to share with you guys because with you know this brand being called The Grass Gets Greener, I want to be an example of that for you. You know, and I, I want to share what's going on in my life um, and not just what has happened in my past, but, you know, what's going on for me right now and continue to, you know, be an, a source of inspiration for you, I hope, and really, you know, to kind of walk the talk. And so it's become very important for me to be transparent and to let you in on whatever's going on for me. And so next week, I'm going to be sharing with you a journey that I have been on since last December, so 2015. And to give you a little idea of what that journey is about, um, well, actually, this will give you a big idea, but the title of next week's episode is My Journey to Getting Off an Antidepressant After 15 Years. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that I've been on an antidepressant. And part of the reason that I've not talked about it really is because I've had some shame around it. And I, I realize, though, that I, I don't need to have shame around it, but I think that just comes from the stigma that, you know, exists in our society. Um, and I am certainly by no means uh, implying that if you take a medication that you should feel any kind of shame around that, um, not at all. But that's how I felt, you know, and, and that's that's what it was for me. And so I am embarked on this journey last December of getting off of this antidepressant that I've been on for the past 15 years. And it's been an interesting road so far. And, um, but it, it's a journey that, you know, I've chosen to undertake and I'm going to, you know, explain to you in, in next week's episode why I chose that and why it's important to me. And really, I, I just want to share everything about it because like I said, I, I want to be transparent. I want you guys to know, and, and I want to be an example of the work that I'm doing here and, you know, just share all of my journey with you, past and present. So I hope that you'll come back and and join me for that. It's going to be very vulnerable and definitely a little bit scary, but it's something that I want to do. And, you know, maybe someone listening will need to hear it and it'll help them in some way with with what they're going through if, if they're going through something similar. So, if you're interested in checking it out, then please come back for that one next Monday. It would mean a lot to me. And in the meantime, head over to iTunes or Stitcher if you haven't left a rating and review yet so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Have hope.